Hey everybody and welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Canon FTB and FTBN. So if you have one of these and it has a different interface here or a plastic tip on the advance or a larger shutter button, you have an FTBN. Everything we're going to cover in this video applies to both cameras equally. So let's jump right in. First thing we're going to do is change the battery. Now this camera uses old mercury cell batteries. And there are a few different options today for those because the batteries with the correct voltage, uh, you can buy wine cell batteries with the 1.35 volts, but they are a bit spendy. There are some other options here that I've got for you. So first thing I'm going to do is show you how to physically change the battery. Grab a nickel or some other coin, start to unscrew it, and then just use the knurled edges of the battery cover to unscrew it with your fingers. Doing it that way means that as soon as it comes out, you can grab it in your hands. You have lower risk of dropping it than if you unscrew it the whole way with your nickel or other coin. Here's your battery chamber. What we're going to do is just take a, this is a modern battery of the wrong voltage, but correct size. So I'm going to show you how to load it with this one. Smooth side goes into the camera like that. So if you load it correctly, you can see the text on the outside. Next, we're going to push this in. Try to thread it. There we go. Try to thread it. Thread, thread it. Oh, come on. <sighs> Photographers the world over jumped for joy when they stopped making battery caps like this. Okay, start getting, get the threads into the raceways. Now this should thread on very easily. If it doesn't thread on very easily, what you wanna do is back it out and try again. You don't want to cross thread this because if you cross thread it, you can ruin your battery cap or worse, the threads inside the camera body and then you will not be able to use a battery on it. Or you'll have to buy a new battery cap and battery caps for these are not cheap because you have to buy them from cameras that have failed. So at any rate, that's how you load the battery, and you just put it in like that. Once you've loaded it, you check the battery here. Let's see if this one works. Nope. Okay, meter is actually functionally dead on this camera. So you check the battery here, and that will let you know that you have a good battery. Okay. Now, if you use one of these modern batteries, it's 1.5 volts, which is not the correct 1.35 volts. And that means your camera is going to underexpose your images by a couple of stops. And that means all of your images will be very dark and very, very hard to work with. So there are a couple of things you can do. If you only have the 1.5 volt batteries, or if you have one of these brass dumb adapters and an A76 or 357 type battery, you can use that as well in here, but that's also 1.5 volts. So this setup is functionally the same as the LI650, is that what it's called? 625, the uh, 625 battery and the 357 in the adapter are functionally the same. And both of them will deliver too many volts. So what you've got to do is if you're going to use those options, go with the Sunny 16 rule. And what that means is you're going to take a meter reading and you're going to set your aperture to f16. And if you have 400 ISO film, then your shutter speed should be round about 1 500th. And what's going to happen is your camera is going to say that, no, hold on, you have way, way, way too much light when you have this setting. So then you're going to adjust your ISO, probably a couple of stops, that's the wrong direction. Is it? I can't tell. Nope, I had it the right way. Probably a couple of stops until you get a proper meter reading. So it, on a sunny day with the sun to your back, F16 and 1 500th is pretty darn close to accurate with 400 ISO film. If you're using 100 ISO film, F16 and 1 1 25th, pretty darn close to accurate. 250, whatever it is. If you're using 800, you want to set it to 1,000. And then just adjust your ISO dial until you get a proper meter reading and you have used your ISO dial to compensate for the incorrect voltage of the modern batteries and you're set to go. Okay, another option, bit spendy. These run around about 30 bucks a pop. 
this is a voltage adapting adapter. It's got a little doodad in there that reduces a 357 class battery to 1.35 volts. So you just put it in now. These are a little bit thicker than the brass thumb adapters and the standard batteries. So some cameras don't like these one bit. And I cannot remember if the FTB is one of them because this guy's meter is completely toast. Come on. The threads do not want to go on the raceway with this in here. That little millimeter, half millimeter of additional thickness makes a lot of difference when threading this cap. Part of the problem with these adapters is because they are a little bit thicker, sometimes the caps, which carry voltage for the meter, don't connect with the part of the battery holder they're supposed to, and then the voltage that the circuit isn't completed. That's assuming that the battery cap will even go on with it, which it doesn't, does not want to do. All right, I'm going to give up on that. I cannot get the voltage adapting battery adapter to work with this camera. Okay, so that's another option. However, I would suggest that these things get lost very easily. I've lost a number of them. And uh, if you're not being very judicious about making sure that they don't get lost, that's an expensive thing to replace every time one disappears. The last option that you have is to send your FTB to a ca camera repair person who can modify the circuitry by inserting a resistor into it or diode. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer, I don't know the difference. So basically, the FTB, you can do it yourself if you can take the top of the camera off. That's kind of a difficult proposition to do it and put it back together correctly. So with this camera, it's just a lot easier to pay the few bucks. Send it off to a repairman who will give it an overhaul and make sure everything works in it and modify the circuitry for you. That's the best way to do it because then you can take the modern batteries and pop them in here and it will meter correctly with the modern batteries. So if you can spend the money to do that, that's my recommended course of action. All right, next thing let's talk about is mounting and unmounting the lens. Here we have the lens mounted, and this is the same if you have an FD lens with a silver ring as well. There's a red dot here and a red dot here. To remove the lens, you just want to turn the silver ring counterclockwise until they line up, then pull the lens off. And then what you can do is grab a different lens, find that red dot, that red dot, pop it on the front, and there you go, you've now changed your lenses. And as long as you're not taking a photo at the time that you change your lenses, has no effect whatsoever on your camera, on your film, because this is an, an SLR with an interchangeable lens system, the focal plane shutter protects your film when you're changing lenses. So really simple process for that. Next, we're gonna load and unload film. Again, super easy with this camera to Open the film back if if your film guides aren't or fill, if your light seals aren't goo, glue. You just lift this and it will pop open. Grab your film now. If you notice in the here are a couple of forks in the film rewind knob. Those connect mechanically with the film cassette spool, the spool that's in the center of it. So you're going to drop the film cassette in here, put this back in place, and get the knob seated pull out a leader, pop it right here, and then, oh, come on. This film has such a strong memory that it does not want to stay in place. There we go. So you hold your, you, you wanna bring the end of your leader to that red line index right there. Put your fingers here, and once the quick load covering is in place, you can take your fingers off of it because this forces the sprocket holes to engage with the, uh, uh, it's tension, the, sp the, the tension sprocket right here. Now we just close that up. And what we're going to do is advance. You look on the top of your camera here. We're going to advance until we get to frame one, which is usually three frames. There we go. We're at frame one. Now, next thing we want to do is make sure that there's no slack in the film. So we just tighten this up until we get resistance. Don't keep going. You don't want to damage your camera or break your film just until there's slack. And, and one way you know that the film is being taken up is if you look at the knob and it spins as you advance the film, 
now you know your film is being taken up in the camera. There's a mechanical connection because of the way that this interfaces with the film. As the film moves, it forces this to spin. It's also a good way to check that you have done it correctly. Okay, after you've loaded your film, now we know that we had 400 ISO or ASA film in there, so we're just going to adjust this dial till it gets to 400 right there. So to adjust it, you just lift it up and then adjust it to the number that you're shooting at. ASA and ISO, again, same exact thing. 400 ASA is exactly the same as 400 ISO. And now you just go on. You're gonna shoot your film throughout the course of the day, just like that. When you get to the end of the film to rewind it, you lift out that lever, you push down the film rewind knob, and then you rewind. Don't open your film back until you have completely rewound the film after you're done with it. Film is one and done. So if you do this and open up your film back while the film is still outside of the film's cassette, you will ruin all of the film that you have already shot. But I'm doing this and this film gets used in all of my videos, so it's been shot for a long time. But I want you to see how it works and goes through the camera. So whenever you sh trigger the shutter, film gets taken up here, and the quick load system keeps tension on the sprocket holes like that so that the film is advanced easily. And you can see that there's no pulling back on this because this is not letting the film move backwards. And that's just how it advances through the camera. Also over here, very nice, and something that a lot of later cameras didn't do, the film is wound in the same direction here as it is coming out of the cassette. Most later cameras wound it in the opposite direction. This allowed the film to retain its curl. I, professional cameras into the 80s and 90s wound film this way as well. So I tend to think of this as being preferable. I don't know if there's a difference. I just like it. At any rate, so you've gone through your whole day. You've shot your entire roll of film. You have not opened the back of your film. When you rewind your film, this is what happens. You hold down the rewind button, and then you rewind it back into the cassette. And you can hear that sound of the film exiting the quick load with the film back closed. Now, in real life, what you want to do is rewind the film all the way into the cassette. I need to reuse this film for other videos, so I'm not going to. And then after you have rewound this film completely, then you open up your film back and you simply pull the film cassette out of the, out of the camera, grab your next one, put it in, and keep shooting. Or, if you're done for the day, trigger your shutter, close your camera back, and you're ready to set your camera down for the day. So, um, you also want to completely rewind the film into the cassette so that you don't accidentally use it again and end up with double exposures on your entire frame, uh, roll of film. So the next thing let's talk about is how to use a flash with this camera. This camera has two ways to use a flash. There is a hot shoe on top of it here, which can use any X, so there are two types of flash, bulb and xenon. X flashes are what this can use, and any flash you can buy today is an X flash. A bulb flash has interchangeable bulbs. So if you can't change the bulb every time you use the flash, um, then you have an X flash. At any rate, so this will use X flashes. And just if you're picking one up for your FTB, buy the, the most basic one you can because none of the advanced features are usable with this camera on a modern high-end flash. So getting an, uh, the, the cheapest fully manual flash you can get is ideal. You can plug it into the hot shoe, you can plug it into the PC port right here. Now some techniques for using a flash. Turn your head sideways to follow along. Let's pretend that this is the flash. If you mount your flash right here on top of your camera, what's going to happen is your light, the light from the flash is going to exit, reach your subject, and bounce right back down to the lens, and it's going to make your subject look flat and waxy. For portraits, this is the worst possible setup you can use. So when you're buying a flash, or uh, try to get one that has an articulating head that can be moved up and down. That way, if you mount it on your hot shoe, you can articulate your flash upwards, bounce it up to the ceiling, and then back down. The reason that it works, bouncing it up to the ceiling and then back down, 
is that you are um, mimicking the way that we see light all the time. Whether it's overhead light from a ceiling or light from the sun, light reaches us from above. So our eyes and brains are used to seeing subjects lit from above. And we consider that natural and flattering. So that's what you want to do with your flash if you mount it on the hot shoe. You can also use a PC port here and a cable. And if you do that, you can hand hold your flash and put it wherever you want. Or you can grab a flash bar that screws into the bottom of your camera and screws into the bottom of your flash like that. And then have your flash pointing off to the side or off to the side like this. This is preferable to having the flash on top of your camera, though it's not as good as being able to have your camera, your flash over here, and then articulate it up towards the ceiling like that. So at any rate, basically what you want to try to do with your flash is mimic the use, the, the way that light actually appears. Now let's talk about your flash settings on your camera. I said in the first video that 1 60th of a second is your flash sync speed. That is the fastest shutter speed you can use with a flash on this camera. The reason is that 1 60th of a second is the fastest speed at which the film is open to light for the entire duration of the exposure. So let's say that what you're looking at right now is what's going to be on the film. When you take a picture, the first curtain opens and then at 1 60th, it finishes traveling and then the second one closes. And about 1 60th of a second elapses where the film is open to light. When that first curtain reaches the end over here, that's when the flash fires. And then the second curtain closes. If you're shooting at 1 500th of a second, the, the shutter speed doesn't get faster because the curtains move faster. The first one opens and then the second one follows. So with shutter speeds faster than a 60th at no time is the entire piece of film for that frame exposed to light. So if you use the, the flash at 1 500th, let's say, the second curtain's following, first curtain finishes the travel and the flash triggers. What is here will be exposed to light from your flash. What is here will not be and will be dark. So all you'll get is a partially exposed frame of however wide the gap between the two curtains is. Okay, so what if you're shooting at one second? First curtain opens, flash triggers. You have one second then where the film is exposed to light and then the second curtain closes. So anything slower than 1 60th of a second, you can use the flash. Anything faster, you cannot use the flash and have the entire frame exposed. The next thing we're gonna do is talk about how to uh, use stop down metering. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is set your meter to on. Anytime you meter, your meter needs to be on. If you're not gonna be metering, you can leave the meter off. Set the meter to on. And then we're going to set the aperture here to whatever we want to use. And we're going to set the shutter speed to whatever we want to use. And then we're going to go and push this down so that the aperture closes. Okay. Basically, at this point, what we're going to do is take a meter reading. I've got it set to f5.6. And now I'm going to adjust the shutter speed until the match needle meets the circle. Inside the the meter off to the side, off to the right side, there's a circle, and that's going to move up and down as you adjust settings. And then there's a needle, and that needle's gonna come up, and when that needle is inside the circle, that means you've got a proper exposure. Underexposed, overexposed. So basically you're trying to line up the needle with the circle like that. And all you need to do with stop down is set your lens to the aperture you want and take a meter reading. Now. The meters in these are not perfectly accurate at small apertures. So if you're going to use an aperture for your image smaller than f5.6, what you want to do is take your reading at f5.6, so we know that it's 1 1 25th of a second, you can see there, at f5.6 is a proper meter reading. But we actually want to use f11. So once we've taken our meter reading, we're going to set this to f11, and then we're going to compensate by giving 
us two more light, stops of light. The aperture has cut two stops. We need to add two stops with the shutter. So now we're at 1 30th of a second and f11. And the reason is because old light meters, and by old I mean anything older than about the 90s, are going to be less accurate the smaller the aperture gets. Cameras of this vintage, and even into the 80s and 90s, with apertures smaller than f5.6, will bias to underexpose. So if you take a stop down reading at f16, you are likely to find that your images are one to two stops underexposed. At f5.6, they're still going to be reasonably accurate. So that's why you want to meter off f5.6 and then compensate if you're using f8, 11, 16, or 20. Now that we've done all of this stuff, let's, <laughs> stuff, that's such an accurate word. Um, now that we've done all of this with the camera, let's put all of this together and see how to take a photo. Okay. So this is a full manual mode camera. You're always going to be responsible for adjusting the shutter speed and aperture yourself and getting a proper exposure. So what you want to do is get your meter reading and let's say that 1 1 25th and f5.6 is correct. Okay, great, we've got the settings or you can adjust them to whatever you want your exposure to be as long as the circle and needle line up. Next thing you're gonna do is focus your subject and okay, oh, there now we're in focus and take your picture. And that is the process for taking a picture with the Canon FTB. Very simple, it's designed to be really user-friendly and very easy. So again, get your meter reading, dial in your aperture and shutter speed, focus, take your picture, advance. That's all there is to it. Okay, what about double exposures? Let's talk about the science of double exposures really quickly. Let's say that your proper exposure was 1 1 25th at f5.6. If you take two exposures like that onto the same piece of film, it's going to be overexposed. It will be dense and dark. And basically, it, uh, what that means, uh, thick is another, another word for it. What that means is that when you go to print it in the darkroom, you'll have longer print times and reduced contrast. If you digitize it, you'll have reduced contrast and increased image noise. So having a proper exposure on your film is a good idea. Okay, so 1 1 25th at f5.6 is a proper exposure. If we're gonna do a double exposure, we need to cut that light in half. There are two ways to do it. Because this is a fully manual camera, it's all up to you how you do it. You can either do it by adjusting the aperture or the shutter speed. So we're gonna start with the aperture. Half as much light from f5.6, we're going to have to move the aperture one way, and it's going to be to f8. These are fractions, so higher number is less. Basically, f8 is a smaller opening than f5.6, and it cuts the amount of light by one stop, which is what you need to cut the light by to do a double exposure. Okay, that's great, but I want the f5.6 depth of field, not the f8 depth of field. Okay. 1 1 25th is our shutter speed. We can cut the amount of light in half by adjusting this. And if you guessed to 1 2 50th, you are correct. Again, fractions, higher number, half as much light. 1 2 50th of a second is half the time as 1 1 25th. So half the number of photons get through to the film. Okay, so we're gonna do our double exposure and we know that we're gonna leave it at, at f5.6 and we're gonna use 1 2 50th of a second as our shutter speed. Okay, we're gonna take our first frame. Now if we just advance it, we've just taken a single underexposed frame. So we take our first frame. Next, we have to prevent the film from advancing. What we're gonna do is flip out the film rewind lever. We're gonna find the film rewind button on the bottom and we're gonna hold that there and now we're going to advance the film. So we have to do all of those. Holding the film rewind lever prevents the film from being taken up. Holding the film rewind button prevents the film tension sprocket and internal gearing from being stripped as we advance the, uh, as we rearm the shutter. And then advancing the, using the film advance lever rearms the shutter, but because we're holding those things, it doesn't advance the film. Now we take our second exposure 
and advance. At this point, we need to take a dead frame. Now, the reason is that when you take a double exposure and you do that process, after you take your second frame, it takes a part of the frame advance lever stroke before the gearing re-engages, and then the frame only advances part way. So if you take your next frame immediately, there is going to be overlap, and you will ruin both of your frames. So what you do is you set your shutter speed to a thousandth and your aperture to f16, put your lens cap on, or if you don't have your lens cap handy, pop the front of your lens up against your leg, take a dead frame and advance. And what that does is that guarantees that you now will not have an overlap between your double exposure and your next frame. That is it. That is everything we had to go over with the Canon FTB. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera. <laughs>